Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Cheeky Natives. It's your boy Le Tlokonolo, flying solo today because you know, at the Open Book Festival, which has absolutely been so incredible, uh, meeting you know some of our faves, um, from Man Booker, shortlistees to other interesting authors in South Africa and internationally and it's just been fantastic but we obviously have to give you a bit of the lowdown of what's happening here in Cape Town and who we can talk to and we obviously have to have like wonderful conversations so today we're going to speak to the brilliant like absolutely brilliant um, author of two books the first one is independence and the second one is like a mule bringing ice cream to the sun so sarah ladipo manyeko was raised in nigeria and has lived in kenya france and england she holds a phd from the university of california and teaches literature at san francisco state university sarah sits at boards of hitchbrook and san francisco museum of african diaspora she's also the chair of the judges for the uh Eta Salat Prize for Literature in 2015, her first ever, the first ever Pan-African Prize celebrating first-time African writers' published fiction books. Her novel, Like a Mule Bringing Ice Cream to the Sun, was shortlisted for the Goldsmith Prize in 2016 and the California Book Awards in 2018. And today we'll be talking to her about her first novel, which celebrated 10 years, um, Independence. Hi, Sarah. Hi, and thank you. So much fun, and I just love the Cheeky Natives, I love what you do, so thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for agreeing to this, you know, you could be out on the beach. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> instead, we're, we're sitting here talking about books. Wonderful, preferable to being out on the beach. I wanted us, before we start the conversation, just for you to do a reading from Independence, just to give people a feel of what brilliance is in store for them. <laughs> okay, so this is from chapter one. One could begin with the dust, the heat, and the purple bougainvillea. One might even begin with the smell of rotting mangoes tossed by the side of the road, where flies hummed and green-bellied lizards bobbed their orange heads while loitering in the sun. But Tayo did not notice these. Instead, he walked in silence, oblivious to his surroundings. With a smile on his face, he thought of the night before when he had dared to run a hand beneath the folds of Modupe's wrapper. Without him even asking, Modupe had loosened the cloth around her waist. Of course, they'd kissed many times before, usually in the Lebanese cinema when all was dark, but that was nothing compared to last night. And while Tayo was lost in his thoughts, his father, who walked alongside, noticed the smile and read it as excitement. For the forthcoming trip i think i read the first page and i was like i cannot stop reading <laughs> that's literally like what happened to me i was like i just can't stop reading i said this to your flan but i think it's also worth mentioning on the podcast there is something very clean about your writing and i want us to talk a bit about like some of your writing inspirations like who are you reading to write the way that she writes oh well i'm i'm glad you find it clean and um you know thank you who am I reading? You know, I think, uh, I was going to say all this month or the past month, I've been talking about Toni Morrison, but the truth is I talk about her all the time. <laughs> um, you know, talking ab about her now wistfully, knowing that she has passed. Um, I had the incredible opportunity of meeting her in her home and it was just, um, just wonderful to meet someone that you have admired for a long time. Um, I admire her word work, which is so sublime. Um, I admire just what she has tried to do to establish a whole kind of new canon of stories. Um, so she's certainly someone who inspires me. There's no way that anyone can write like her, but she certainly inspires me. Um, so, you know, I'm inspired by people like her. I know when I started writing, um, independence. Um, I was inspired by. Um, now I'm just blanking out. He just won the Nobel. He was the last person to win the Nobel Prize. Um, Murakami. Yes, Murakami. Yes. Um, so I, some of his writing. I love the way that he turns his hand to different genres. Um, I'm inspired by poets, and that's why I 
took the lines of uh, two two lines of a poem to entitle my next novel. Um, and then I'm inspired, while I'm inspired by sort of the greats, I'm also inspired by emerging writers. Mm -hmm. And this has been so exciting for me to be at the Open Book Festival and meet new writers that I continue to be inspired by. So one of the um, newer writers at the time when I was writing Independence was Helon Habila, and he won the Kane Prize for his, I don't know if the short story was entitled Waiting for an Angel, but that's what the, his novel was entitled. And I remember being really inspired by um, by that. And um, also, you know, I, I'm inspired by text, but I'm also inspired by other art forms. Mm -hmm. So music inspires me, film inspires me. So um, when I was uh, writing Independence, I was listening to a lot of Fela, I was listening to a lot of Bob Marley, and I was listening to a lot of Hugh Masakela, mm -hmm. in particular his album Hope. Mm -hmm. And many of the songs in that album tell a story, and one of the songs is Marketplace, which is something of a love story. Um, so yeah, a very long response to your question <laughs> on inspiration. <laughs> but thank you for that. I think you, you've touched quite an, a bit. Um, I know that people ask you this all the time about meeting Toni Morrison, uh, but what do you think it did for you upon meeting her and interacting with you? What do you think it did for you as a writer to meet someone that you look up to and have an opportunity to, to dine in her company? I think a number of things, and, and this is actually why I wrote a personal essay entitled On Meeting Toni Morrison, because I wanted to get down on paper, you know, some of the thoughts around this. So, but I think some of the highlights would be, I'd always admired her as a writer. But then seeing her and meeting her, I was just blown away by her generosity of spirit. Um, I co-interviewed her and we were supposed to be with her for an hour. We were there for two hours and we were the people that said at the end, we should leave. You know, we, we, we don't want to overstay our welcome, but she was just willing to give us time. And this was on an Easter Saturday in her home. I, so the generosity was something that struck me. Um, you know, it's her tenderness, her, the, and these are things that, you know, I remember when James Baldwin passed, she was saying that, you know, Baldwin gave us tenderness, Baldwin gave us language, he gave us courage. courage yeah. And these are things that I think she gave to us, and I could see that when I was actually with her. She is so funny. We laughed and laughed. And again, you know, that was just something, you know, very theatrical, a real thespian. And I just, I love that about her. Um, yeah, as you can see, I could go on yes. and on. No, no um, but I, I think yeah. it's important, like, you know, meeting the people that you look up to and just seeing them also as real people. Because mm. so, sometimes we think of Toni Morrison mm. as a great writer, but not, but not her, mm, yeah. you know. Um, to talk about... Independence. I really enjoyed reading Independence. I I couldn't stop. Like I just found oh. myself just being like, "What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next?" And I find that I thought the title was really striking, and I wanted us to talk a bit about the title. I mean, Independence is sort of set in the 1960s, which is the period where Nigeria was getting its independence. But also, Independence sort of speaks oh. about the type of relationships that are happening in the novel. And I wanted to know why you chose to title it Independence and not something else. I think I've always been drawn to titles that leave room for the imagination. And so for the, the longest time while I was writing the novel, the working title was Tayo and Vanessa. Those were my two protagonists. Um, but then when it actually came down to choosing a title, I bounced a lot of ideas around, um, you know, and I thought of books uh, with titles that I had admired. So I'm trying to think of some of those books. Some, Umberto Eco wrote um, his, the book that I remember reading close to that time as Name of the Rose. And again, that, that's got nothing to do really with the book. Um, I'm thinking, I don't, I don't remember when Zeke Sundar wrote Ways of Dying, um, but you know, I, so I was just inspired by titles of books 
um, that allowed me to bring my own thoughts and bring my own interpretation. And I settled on independence because, as you alluded to, I felt that it was a title that allowed people to think. Um, but it also spoke to what I felt were the two sort of central tenets in a way, or two central aspects of the book, the relationship, um, personal relationship between the two main characters and the relationship between nations and, and um, you know, in, along the lines of politics and so forth. Um, and so the book is entitled Independence, but the un sort of the unsaid word is interdependence. Yes, yes, yes. And in a way, I think inter interdependence is a theme that runs through all of my work, be it fiction or non-fiction. The desire to um, highlight the fact that we all, we need to work together and the desire not to be fearful of the other, whatever the other may happen to be. And yeah, so I think unconsciously I was tapping into something that's something of a bedrock for my writing. And independence is a love story, a love story between Taya and Vanessa, but also I think an ode about thinking about Nigeria. And that love story was something else. I, I struggled, I, I struggled with Tayo. And I think in part I also struggled with Vanessa. But I wanted to know, so you, you, you said it in, in different countries, so Tayo leaves Nigeria to go study at Oxford. And uh, a part of, a large part of the book is a historical novel, which I think you did brilliantly. Like, I kept going back to be like, oh, did this really happen? And I was like, oh, it did really happen. And I wanted to know why it was important for you to place the historical context in writing this love story. Well, to refer to Morrison again, Morrison has said, if there's a story you want to read and can't find, then write it. And so 15 years or so ago, when I was writing the novel, I was longing to find more of a reflection of the recent history for Nigeria and the, the history between Nigeria and other nations reflected in, the, in art or in literature. And I wasn't finding that. And I thought it, you know, it was such a rich period, the 1960s. Um, so much was happening around the world. And there was such a great spirit of Pan-Africanism. And I felt at the time of writing the novel that the narrative that was so predominant was the narrative of things fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, and that is definitely an important narrative. And it is, it is, it's a reality that things have fallen apart in many nations across the world, not just Nigeria um, and so forth. But I wanted to make sure that we didn't forget that back in the 1960s, back in 1960 when Nigeria gained its independence, there was huge optimism and excitement for the years to come. And um, so much so that in the course of doing the research for the novel, I read uh, so many newspapers. I read a journal called The West African. I read all the Oxford student newspapers at the time. And particularly looking back to the Nigerian newspapers, you know, things that you would never, things you would just think, wow, you know, Nigeria really thought it would be like an example to the rest of the world <laughs> instead of being known as, you know, uh, a 419 capital and corruption. I mean, none of that was in the air at the time. And it's not that long ago. And I just didn't want that. I just didn't want that to be lost. I wasn't writing a history book, but I wanted to have sort of a reflection mm. of those times. And do people often characterize independence as a historical novel as opposed to a love story? It's interesting. I think both, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think it is both. Yeah. 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 I was also interested in, in, in the f familial love. So Tayo's relationship with his father is sort of a very proud, like, like his father is very proud that my son, you know, is going to England to study at Oxford and often, you know, wants Tayo to tell him who he's meeting there as sort of bragging rights in Nigeria. And I wanted to know, is it something that happens in Nigeria, like growing up, like your parents are like, oh, my child is in America. Like, was it, is it, is it like in 
in the Nigerian, because I mean, in the South African context, our parents want you to do all these things so they can tell people mm-hmm. where you've been around the world. <laughs> oh yeah, and now that I'm a mother, yeah, I know. I, <laughs> I brag about my son. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's you know, that's one of the universal aspects again. So you know, we're talking about a particular story set at a particular time, particular place. But at the end of the day, one hopes that your book will transcend time and place um, and I, I feel that you know that certainly is something that resonates with other Nigerians or South Africans yeah. they're just you're just um, uh, pointing to but I think it's it's a universal thing you know um, and that's the beauty of art the beauty of fiction that it can hopefully speak across time and place there's also something important that you do in the book. I mean, I, I often have a lot of conversations with people who grew up in a West African context who, unlike South Africa, didn't go to like a, the visceral, visceral, in-your-face type of racism. And, and so Tayo goes to England and it feels like for the first time he discovers he's black. Mm. And I wanted to know why that was important for you to, to put in the novel because um, of a place like England which has colonized other countries. Why it was important for you to make Tayo discover that he's black and that there is such a thing as racism? Well, I think I mean, that's just a reflection of reality. And again, you know, going back to this business of uh, narrative, um, you know, there, at the time that Tayo was studying in England, which was around the time that also my father was studying. My father's story is not the same as Tayo's, but they, my father studied in England um, around the same time. Um, when you would go and try and find housing, for example, you would see signs and windows or in places saying, no dogs, no Irish, no blacks. And again, this is a narrative that English people have conveniently forgotten <laughs> it didn't happen that long ago and you know as you're trying to, as you're looking at things today for example and trying to come to grips with what what is it what you know what are some of the the nasty sentiments behind for example underpinning brexit um say i'm not saying everything to, you know related to brexit has to do with a fe- with fear of the other and racism and so forth but yeah. there are certainly those elements mm-hmm. and you have to go back and look and see where did this all start from I mean, even rolling back to colonialism and the ideas that underpin sort of this you know we're going to civilize the rest of the world and um so i was basically describing what would have happened to someone in in th- at that time um and uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about. So now we have Tayo in 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 England, and he's you know reading to do a degree in England, and he's encountering different people. And one of the he leaves Medupe in Nigeria. They were in a relationship. You know, they were going to be together forever because this is what we say when we're young. And he gets to England and. It sort of feels as if when he gets to England, he's like, "Mm, I don't know if I can talk about the things that I want to talk about with this person and meets other people who sort of titillate his, you know, his intellect and then encounters Christine and there's this loving, loving, loving thing happening, but then meets Vanessa. And I'm wondering, because I'm thinking of myself, and I'm mm. like, was there a conflict for Tayo to, you know, because he he seems to be quite pan-Africanist, you know, I'm here for the black woman, and then meets Vanessa, and it just seems like some of that is thrown out the window. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, but then you also have to remember the context from which Tayo is coming from, as we were talking about, you know, the colonial experience in Nigeria was different to that in Southern Africa. So the experience, albeit that there was colonialism, there wasn't apartheid. Yeah. And so the experience of race that, uh, or you know, racial divisiveness, apartness, apartheid, is something that Tayo really hadn't experienced growing up. Um, and so, as you said, when he gets to England, this whole 
the, the opposition that he meets with Vanessa's father, he's quite kind of naive mm -hmm. about race um, in a way that a Southern African coming from South Africa at that time would not have been. So I think there's also wanting to reflect that in the book a little bit and sometimes just sort of, you know, the book may not necessarily answer these questions, but it does raise questions. It does have characters who say, what is it, Tayo, that you're uh, attracted to white women? What does that mean? Yeah. Um, is, is this just an exoticism kind of thing? Um, so, you know, all of these questions that swirl around, or not, maybe not all of them, but many of them, I wanted to, at a very minimum, raise. And it seems that Yusuf has that difficulty you know Yusuf is like yeah it's fun to be around there maybe they're exotic but they're not good for marriage mm -hmm. and I think for me like what happens with Yusuf blew my mind because I was like oh oh you know mm -hmm. I don't want to spoil it for people who want to read the book but I was just like wow I think also something that I found funny is the interaction where um, Joyce asked Yusuf do you speak Nigerian? <laughs> and Yusuf is like, no one speaks Nigerian. But I think it's also the, what you were trying to bring about, and I wanted to know if this is what you're trying to do, there's this sort of blanket, I don't know anything about Africa, so I'm going to ask someone if they speak African as if it's a monolithic thing. Um, so there's like an ex ignorance about knowing about the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to know if that is what you're trying to draw out when, with that encounter in particular. Yeah, I mean, again, to a certain extent, that's a reflection of reality. I, I've been asked, I don't know how many times if I speak African. Um, so th there's, there's that on that level. Um, you know, I think the other thing that I want to say with this, though, is that in some respects, this could also be read as a coming of age story. Yes. So while the characters are wrestling with these larger issues and issues of, of racism and so forth, they're also just growing up. Yeah. And so there is a part of the characters, be it Yusuf or Tayo, who are young men figuring out what does it mean to be a man? Um, what does it mean to be responsible? Um, and they may not be explicitly asking themselves these questions but they are growing up, yeah. or not, as the case may be. And I wonder if... Vanessa is quite a bright person. And I often found... I, I was frustrated with her often, because she knew what the reality was, but seemed to not want to go with the reality. And I'm thinking in particular about the encounter. We know Vanessa's father to be this racist flat out racist and he's just like look these people cannot be together mm -hmm. and more importantly he's like they can't be together because <laughs> of the children because the, there's some it's it's a fake concern that the father had it's just like what will happen to the children but he didn't care about that he's just like it's not gonna happen but I, I found that Vanessa um, was naive mm. or maybe Vanessa was just in love and she couldn't she wanted to hold on to this love and I wanted to know what your reflections were about that particular tension in, in Vanessa as a character. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a point in the novel where Tayo says straight up to her, you know, you're naive to think, you know, what, what is it, um, and it, you know, that your father isn't racist and then she comes back to him and says, well, of course. she basically says, yes, I know he's yeah. racist. <laughs> You know, so again, that's also what I was trying to explore is the contradictions that we have as humans. Sometimes we say one thing, but we really believe another thing or we're not really sure what we believe. Um, and I, you know, I have to say I, I struggled with my protagonist as well. Mm -hmm. um, one thing about having a book like this that's now read by a lot of people, particularly students, is that I hear what people like <laughs> and particularly what people don't like. <laughs> Um, like, why did you make this character like this? Oh, this character is so irritating. And I have a lot of women. It's, it's, it's also interesting for me to, to, to actually see in a decade, you know, definitely a decade later, I have more women saying to me, ah, oh, Tile, why can't he, no, you know, m m cross it with him, which is good. Uh, not cross all the time. I yeah. don't want to diss my dear Tile as a character. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting how, I guess what I'm trying to say is, it's interesting how 
we read books, but a book also reads us. Yeah, yeah. And it's a reflection of kind of what's in the zeitgeist, how we're feeling, and so forth. So I didn't set out, I guess this is the other thing that I say to, to particularly students who come with their complaints, as well as their praises sometimes, but I didn't set out to create perfect characters. Mm -hmm. Or likable. Or likable characters. Yeah, yeah. I set out to, what I set out to do was to create characters that hopefully feel authentic. Now, you can like them, you can not like them, um, but the goal of a novelist, in my mind at least, is to get as close as you can to painting an authentic character. There's also a theme of, of parenting cross-generationally. So on the one hand, you have Vanessa's father who is racist and comes from a very particular you know, we did it for the country. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, you have Tayo's dad, who's proud, but you also have Tayo's mom, who, you know, calls him back as soon as tragedy happens. And I wanted to know, because that was an interesting comparison for me. Like, you have this white family who, they have their own sort of like, Vanessa's allowed to say what she wants to say. And then you have this other family where Tayo's not necessarily allowed to say what he wants to say because when he's called home he has to come home mm -hmm. and I it, it's, it, it was an interesting cultural reflection for me and for us as the cheeky natives to think about wow well, actually this is really how what it happens in the world like you could be called home now and you you could protest but you end up coming home mm -hmm. but if you were on the other side you would you could say no mm -hmm. and so was that also something you wanted to bring across that Vanessa and Tayo's love story was more complicated than you imagined. So there was also those elements that may be hidden, but were on the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I think, um, you know, there were some basic understandings that perhaps neither of them fully understood. So again, I think back to the argument that Tayo and Vanessa had when Vanessa said something to the effect of, you know, I love you so much that who cares what our parents think? And Tayo's response is something to the effect of, we can't divorce, we can't separate our relationship from, from our family. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And I think, you know, this was definitely the case for within Nigerian cultures at the time, and still is. And it also has been the case for many European and American cultures, you know, still is uh, for many, and certainly was in the past. So... Yeah, I think, you know, this, relationships are complicated. They are complicated because any relationship between two individuals is complicated anyway. But then they're further complicated by those around us in our immediate circles, whether, you know, people saying, giving their two cents on what they think about relationship. And then even further complicated by the broader, larger macro forces um, at play. I felt that Vanessa had some form of white savior complex. Like when she was speaking about Africa, I was just like, no, stay, stay, stay. And then she she comes to Africa and she, she writes for Africa. And I'm just like, I don't know, like, can we move past like understanding white people has been having a white savior complex like could they just genuinely be interested in Africa and it not being a saviorism type of situation because I think that Vanessa really for me asked me to grapple with that mm -hmm. uh, because for a long time she was like well nobody's writing the story so like and this is also the 1960s 1970s um, and I wanted to know what your reflections were on that mm -hmm. I think this goes back to the business of a book reads us as much as we read a book um, and we in this decade or at this time right now are thinking a lot about these issues you know and the white savior complex and so that's something at the forefront of our thoughts for many of us mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and so we bring that to our reading <laughs> Um, so I don't know if I have an answer for you mm -hmm. I think again I will go back to this thing as a writer that what to you know to, to reference James Baldwin we bear witness mm -hmm. as writers mm -hmm. I'm not going to be a spokesperson yeah. for 
the white race or the black race <laughs> I'm gonna give you a character with all her flaws all her complexities you either believe her or you don't that for me is the priority it's like whether a character is believable first of all yeah, yeah. and then you grapple with the issues later to decide I'm done with this character or you know what I can accept this character or maybe I can believe this character or I can't believe this character. what are your feelings about Vanessa like mm -hmm. I'm just curious to know like me. yes what are your feelings about Vanessa because I there were times when I liked her, but overwhelmingly I was just like, I, I don't know how I feel about you. And this could be the, the, the books reads me, my misgiving about white people in general. So I'm, I'm bringing that into, into Vanessa, like she, she's now carrying everything that I want her to carry. Well, I will say this about writing fictional characters. I don't have to agree with my characters. But I have to find enough room in my heart to love my characters. I cannot hate any of my characters. <laughs> so I'll say that. It doesn't mean I necessarily agree with them or uh -huh. I'm not disappointed with them. Mm -hmm. But it's the same thing, I don't know about you, but it's the same thing for me in real life. I can love someone to bits. And there's still things that really, really irritate me about Yes, them. no, I definitely agree with that. That said, this was my first novel mm -hmm. so if i were to go back and write this novel again i would probably write a different story mm -hmm. because of where i stand right now mm -hmm. and where i want to shine the spotlight and mm -hmm. what i want to be thinking about so my second novel like a mule bringing ice cream to the sun is focused most of the characters are women and it's focused on an older black woman that's that's where my head is right now mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so i think this has also been an interesting thing for me as a writer, you know, when Cassava Public Press said, let's come out with a commemorative issue. There's a part of me that's like, yeah, that's great. But there's also a part of me that's, oh, it's my first novel. Can I just please rewrite it? <laughs> because I want to make it a much better book, you know? <laughs> and um, it's been a really interesting exercise on many levels to go back to the book. I remember before I wrote the novel, I used to hear authors say, oh, you know, once you've written a novel, you don't go back and read it. And I'm like, yeah, sure. I don't believe that because you spend so much time investing, investing in the novel, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. So I'm like, I'm sure everyone's lying. But actually, they're not. <laughs> so I hadn't read it for a decade. And I was this little bit of trepidation, like, what am I going to think? How am I going to feel? Um, and I, I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised that I kept wanting to turn the page and it's also quite funny because I also kept wanting to turn the page because I'd forgotten a lot of oh, what, what I'd written. <laughs> <laughs> when you write a novel they're all different kinds of scenarios so you know Yusuf could have done this that or that yeah and when I was reading the novel I found myself like what did he do what did I make him do <laughs> you know? so and that was kind of sort of a gratifying thing to think oh okay it's even compelling for me even at, after having after, spent exactly um, exactly all those years um, so, so it, on the one hand, it was really gratifying. On the other hand, I could also stand back and say, I'm really proud of what I did at that time in my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm also proud to see how I have evolved and hopefully matured as a writer. And this whole business of, to borrow Michelle Obama's words, becoming, like you're never done. Mm. And um, so, in a way, I'm, you know, I would never want to go to anything I've written and say, this is perfect. This was perfect at the time. Um, but what's most gratifying for me to s is to see how I've continued to, or tried to at least, evolve and grow as a writer. I really struggle with the Tayo. Like in the beginning, I loved him. And then he came back to Nigeria. And then I was like, you know what? No. No, don't do this. No, 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 no. I felt that, and I wanted to know if it's, because sometimes, and I really like the provocation that you made about the book reads us as much as we read it, because perhaps I'm reading it from a 2019 setting, and I'm like, oh, feminist, you know, those, and I'm reading this story, and I'm like, no, why did she do this? Um, and there is a particular way in which black women are written in the book, uh, the infantilizing of Miriam, for instance, and um, Madhup, it's just like there was a, my feminist hat was like, no, no, no. But I wanted to, I, I wanted to ask you about 
why it was that you chose to write about black women in the way that you did in the novel. Um, understanding it's the 1960s, but I wanted to know as, as someone who was writing this novel 10 years ago, why you chose to write the black women in the way that you did. So when you say infantilizing of Miriam, we're seeing Miriam mainly through Tayo's eyes. Yes. So, so I want to make a distinction between the author infantilizing the black women. Yes, and <laughs> Tayo infantilizing. And the, yes. Um, the uh, characters. Yes. Um, again, you know, I'll go back to this that I think it was consistent with this particular character to mm -hmm. see things in this way. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything that's gratifying for me, it's to hear people having these conversations. And to in, so in a way, it's gratifying for me to hear people saying, oh, I'm so frustrated. Hopefully I'm not so frustrated that I don't keep, you know, that I don't yeah, that keep I reading the book. Exactly. <laughs> um, but this is a particular time, a particular place. And this is how, this, this is not to say all characters thought like this, um, but it's consistent with this particular character. At the same time, um, you know, I'd like to say that you do get, you know, I'm thinking of sort of early discussions when they were in Oxford and Christine was coming back to him. You do get characters pushing, female characters, I think, yes, pushing yes. back. You yeah. get Vanessa pushing yes. back. Yes. Um, so, so, so I, because I'm wondering if it's uh, it, it, it felt, because there is a part where Tayo says, you know, often I just say random things because I need her to know that I'm smarter than her type of situation. It, it feels like when Tayo came back from the UK, he, there was a certain appetiness about him. He was like, you know, I've got this Oxford, I'm, I'm this person now, and there's only women of a certain stature that can be with me. And it felt like Miriam ended up where she did because of circumstance. And she was punished because of that. And that I was just like, no, Tayo, like, <laughs> no, no. And then there is a, a long time where, like, it, it, it feels like for me that Vanessa is Tayo's greatest love. So he's never going to forget about Vanessa and now is punishing Miriam for not being Vanessa. That's, yeah, that's how you read it. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, that's how I read it. I just felt that um, because of how he came back um, and, you know, he, I, I feel in some ways that he felt stuck. But he also wanted, he had a love for Nigeria and wanted Nigeria to, to be different. So he stayed in Nigeria, but a part of him wanted to be where Vanessa was. And I, did, I just couldn't... I, you know, the treatment of Miriam really, really got to me. I think, you know, I think, but I think the other angle is that he, there is this, there is this business of, of his loves and who he loved and so forth. But he was also really focused on his nation as mm. well. Mm -hmm. So I think this is another aspect that um, continues to be, is it's a universal timeless thing, which is often this tension between um, family and work and at the end or your vision you know or men or men or women of great vision um, where do you choose to what do you what do you prioritize yeah and you know again I'm, I'm sort of holding back sometimes I don't want to reveal the whole story yes. but um, family came second yeah and so I think that was also something that I was exploring through his character mm. and again it you know the reader brings with them different things yes. so that may not have been something that was for for at the forefront of your thinking yes 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 but it certainly has been at the forefront of other people's thinking and maybe maybe you know older people will have this more at the forefront of their thinking yes yes I, you know i don't know um so i've also had people say to me that this was an interesting exploration in terms of you know, how do we balance all of this? Mm. Um, mm. I mean, I, I definitely thought about that a second because I, I think for me I was clouded by just the fact that he, he loved this person. Circumstance changed 
And so that's what happened. But increasingly, I felt that he was so absorbed in building Nigeria to where he wanted it to be that he forgot about everything else that mattered. I'm thinking particularly about the tragic thing that happened. And he, you know, I don't want to give it away, but he wasn't there, you know, um, because he was, it was, it was about Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And sometimes how love for a person's country can really take the fr forefront of everyone of his own mind and everything else will take a back seat mm -hmm. but to what end mm -hmm. these are questions that the book raises <laughs> to what end mm -hmm. to what end there's also the relationship between Tayo and his own daughter mm -hmm. and uh, where it seems he grapples with wanting to give her independence but also wanting him her to be interdependent on him. So there's, there was also that that you explored, which I thought was really interesting, thinking about the title of the novel, to be like, okay, I see everything. This is what's <laughs> happening. And I wanted to know if that's something, if that was also something that you're exploring because of the type of person that Taya was and having to interact with his daughter in the way that he interacted with the daughter. Yes, it was. And I think also, you know, when you're dealing with characters over, over a period of time, and this book spans a few decades, you want to look at the arc of people's lives and you want to see if there has been change, if they have moved in any sense. And I think um, one of the things that helps us to move, evolve, to be more conscious as people, I think, is when we are interacting with others, often younger generations. And um, so in my mind, I think as a, as a writer, I, you, we have Tayo, we have the set of assumptions and his short-sightedness in some areas. And then you have his daughter who, whether he likes it or not, is also challenging him. And she's very different to perhaps the way he thought she would be. Mm -hmm. um, she is more woke, to use the term of a few years ago, I guess. Um, um, and so, you know, you, you have an older character and the younger character, and you see, like, wh what's going to be the effect of this? Mm. Is this character going to move? Is this character going to change, evolve? And I think, you know, it's up to the reader, you know, what they believe, but certainly there is a lot a fair bit of Tayo thinking and musing and thinking about his daughter, who his daughter's become, um, and perhaps accepting some things that he wouldn't have before. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. There's a lot of also starting over that comes in the book. We have Miriam who starts over, we have Tayo who starts over, we have the daughter who starts over, and I wanted to know why it was that they were if we have Vanessa who starts over. There's a lot of starting over that happens in the book. And I was interested to know why that was there, like why there was the starting over. And I suppose thinking about, because it spans over decades, there was the, the movement of people, they couldn't be stuck in one place. But don't you think we're constantly starting over? In a way, as people, I mean, how boring would it be if we stayed the same? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I also I want to say I I I loved when Miriam had the upper hand. Like I was like, okay, Miriam, yes, uh, yes, because often we don't expect women like Miriam to be able to become who they are meant to be. So I was really grateful for that. Like it was a, a reprieve that I really enjoyed. <laughs> there's also I feel there's a. A starting over in a sense of love lost and love gained and 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 I wanted us to talk about like love so this is a love story what are your own reflections about like love and how we can imagine what love is I'm thinking about James Baldwin when he was asked uh, in an interview a certain question and he said you know the problem with being a writer is that often when you're sort of interviewed like this you're expected to come up with answers <laughs> which is completely antithetical to the business of writing <laughs> because you get to a page and you don't know anything so it's one of these moments that I'm like oh 
what do I think about love? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> can I just say, read some of my books, read some of my essays? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the questions that I have thought about, you know, what makes people fall in love? What holds people together? What is love? Um, in my character, like uh, Mariah, um, you know, connected to love, sensuality, and old age. I mean, so I think I'm going to just cop out and say, read my books. Yeah, read uh, my uh, in terms of what I, how I've been thinking about yes. the issues, not necessarily what I think, and what I think continues to evolve. Mm. I think, mm. um, I think, I think, I think. I mean, you do something remarkable in the book. You, there's a lot of music. I find myself mm. dancing when I was <laughs> listening to the book. And I wanted to know why it was important because there are music that arches the different decades, but there are also music that the characters like. Mm. And I, I wanted us to talk a bit about the music. Mm. I mean, I'm not like books and rhymes mm -hmm. who <laughs> can bring the playlist, but I wanted us to, to, to speak about the music mm. and why it was important for you to ensure the musicality of the book. Well, there are a couple of things. I was listening to a lot of music as I was writing the novel. I think music is very evocative. And there's something about youth I think that, or at least now looking back, looking back to my 20s and 30s, I associate certain music, certain songs, certain albums with certain periods of my life, mm -hmm. and often with falling in love and falling out of love. <laughs> so there had to be music, right? Um, and I think I said earlier that. Um, artists of different sorts including musicians are an inspiration to me mm. so um, you know I wanted to have so so there's there's kind of that reflection um, but you're right there's almost this book has its own soundtrack starting in the 1960s with jazz and then moving into Afrobeat, Fela and then soul and um, some classical music um, so it's reflecting, it's reflective of what the characters are listening, both what the characters are listening to and of the music at the time. And of course the music at the time, you know, the 1960s was such a, uh, such a sort of a boiling pot in many different ways and mm -hmm. so many different sort of musical sounds and experimentation in the musical front as well. So this is also, I guess, another layer to the excitement of that era um, and the excitement just the excitement of the the pain both the pain and the excitement of the 1960s is something that I'm constantly struck by now in our decade this is also a time when there's a lot of feels like there's a lot of tumult around mm. the world and a lot of pain a lot of things that we have to address um, and you have artists trying to make statements in the different forms about this, which is a good thing. And you also have young people, as was the case in the 1960s, at the, at the forefront of really pushing for change, be that around the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, climate change. So there is this interesting resonance for me between the decade that I'm writing about and our decade. You also do something remarkable in the book. I'm remembering particularly the letter that Tayo sends to Vanessa because he's writing a critique. And um, Vanessa, you know, writes back to be like, oh, you can do this and you can do this. And um, then you, s you bring writers into the conversation and I think some of your favorite writers or some of the writers that you are reading, I'm thinking in particularly when you speak about James Baldwin and SK mm. um, and, and bringing them in conversation. I remember reading the line just preceding that and I'm like, oh, Baldwin said this and then there's Baldwin. And I was like, this is, this is stunning. And I wanted to, because it also feels for me like independence is also a library of sorts. There are a lot of of treasures about like if you are thinking about a particular thing these are some of the writers that you can you know read more about and I wanted to know why that was 
Um, that's great. I mean, I'm glad that came across to you. Um, it's true that so, you know some of the writers, many of the writers that are in this novel are people that I have read and I've thought about. And um, I often kind of imagine these conversations that we could have between writers that maybe never met and what would they say and kind of fiction allows you to bring these writers together and put them next to each other. But this also speaks to this kind of the pan-African spirit that, you know, nostalgically perhaps I look back to the 1960s and I see like there were festivals that brought people together, particularly black people from around the world, in a way that I kind of long for more. Mm -hmm. And so being here in South Africa for the Open Book Festival, you have a little bit of that, which is great. I just think that there's so much that we can learn from each other. Um, and then again, you know, a, lo a lot of the sort of the talking about uh, philosophers or politicians and activists is because these characters are young and this is you know stereotypically but it's true this is they're studying they're engaging they're having Malcolm X come to Oxford to talk and so it's all in the zeitgeist and they're really um, trying to come to grips with this and figure out what are our political beliefs and how should we be how should we be as individuals and what difference can we make in the world so I'm I I'd, I've never asked an author this, but I'm wondering if the ending of the book, would you have changed it if you had an opportunity to change it now? Would you change it? The, you know, <laughs> we won't give away the ending. Yeah. But what's bemusing for me is to hear th there are different interpretations of that ending. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say... You could, you, those who haven't read the book, and if you read it, you can maybe think about this. One of the reactions to the ending of the book that just always makes me laugh is someone said, I'll just say at the end of the book, there are two people sitting together outside in Oxford. And one of the readers said to me, I read your ending and I was convinced that the two characters would freeze to death. I had never, okay, this is, you know, I don't know, climate change, I don't know, but it was not, it was definitely not the ending that I had um, had in mind, mm -hmm. but it was the way that they interpreted it, and I think, I will say that the ending for Independence and Like a Mule leave room for the imagination. I didn't know that it would there would be that much imagination in an interpretation. <laughs> um, but to answer your question, would I give a different ending? Um, I wouldn't go back and rewrite the book, as I mentioned, you know, before. Oh, th there's a temptation to rewrite it, and yeah. you know, but that was the book that I wrote, and I leave the ending. I sneakingly wanted the children to end up together. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Maybe they do. And I'm like, why can't we have more? Why can't <laughs> and, and I feel that is really testament to a powerful story. When you read and you're like, no, like, but what's happening? Like, where are these people? Because I, I, I find myself, you know, thinking about what Tayo is getting up to now. Um, That's great and um, whether he's a better person. <laughs> um, and really for me, that, has, that is the testament of a powerful book. Just like when you've read the books and the characters stay with you, so every now and then you wonder about their whereabouts. Um, is that something that you do or do you just let them go once you've written them, you're like, you know what, on to the next one. Well, I think as, as we're talking, I'm remem remembering, let's refer to someone very canonical, Jane Austen who said something to the effect of um, a good book or a great book for me is always too short. Um, so I'm always happy when people say that oh, I just wanted to go on because it means hopefully that, you know, they wanted to read more or they go on and they invent their own. And stories. I mean, I know we're not talking about mm. like a meal bringing ice cream mm. to, to the sun, but that was too short. Mm. Like for me, <laughs> I'm just like, no. <laughs> And um, But Sarah, I just want to say I think that I immensely enjoy your writing. Oh, thank you so and much. And I enjoy what, because I think that often we think fiction doesn't do what non-fiction can do, but I think fiction can do a little bit more of that. I think that fiction allows us to, to imagine differently, but to also grapple with things that we are grappling in daily lives and be like, oh, 
other ca characters excavating other our, our biases our blind spots and I felt like for me independence did a lot of that for me particularly in thinking about interracial relationships and what what those look like what they can look like and I'm thinking this was the 1960s and we're in 2019 and we're still grappling with the same type of things so thank you very much for 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 the book and thank you very much for writing um, your writing is really refreshing Thank you so much. Your program is super refreshing <laughs> and thank you for what you do. And I wanted to know what is next for you like, you know, normally we want to know so we like we re ready ourselves for more. Is there anything that you're working on currently? Well, I think the pattern so far has been that between novels I turn my hand to non-fiction. So I've um, <coughs> recently been writing profile pieces. So I wrote the piece on meeting Toni Morrison, on re and then I wrote the next uh, profile piece was um, on meeting uh, Mrs. Obama, and then I wrote a piece on meeting Mrs. Harris, who is my 99 and a half year old neighbor, who's just amazing. Um, and I'm currently working on meeting, a new on meeting, which is on a political activist from Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. So that's the next profile piece that I'm working on. Um, independence is set in the past, like a mule set in the present, the next book is set in the future. Ooh, that's exciting. <laughs> and thank you. Thank I you. just want to say thank you for allowing us to imagine so at the Chicanators, we give people a rating. So we're like, oh, we like your book, and um, this is what we'll give you. You know, South Africa is very politicized, and we're in the in 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 the process of reparations and nation building by giving people land. Uh, we're sitting in the wonderful Cape Town, so we thought to give you a private beach. And mm -hmm. there's a private beach just down the road from where we are called Lindano. Okay. which is really fancy mm -hmm. and we like you deserve to have you know a private beach while you write your on meetings but also as you're writing about the future to sit in the breeze and enjoy while Lindano. we actually have beaches well, we <laughs> <laughs> there may not be beaches for very long so while we have beaches you have Lindano thank you but thank you so much for for writing but more importantly, thank you for engaging me, for engaging the Cheeky Natives about your book, which we found really important and which we hope, you know, will sell more. And, you know, we'll get th four million copies, five million copies. And like a mule, will do the same in any of your, the work that you do. Um, and thank you also to Cassava Republic. I think that Cassava Republic is doing really brilliant work in sort of bringing African writers together to write stories that haven't been told that are important. That's true. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And if people want to get a hold of you, you know, on the socials, because this is our generation, which is like, where can we follow you? I'm very old school, so um, I only joined Facebook, which is ancient, I know. Who's on <laughs> Facebook anymore? Um, two years ago. And uh, I wish, I mean, I wish I could do more social media, but the truth is that I really want to write and I, I think some people are better than this than me but I I think if I were on more social media I would just be too distracted mm -hmm. and um, so yeah but you you can I have a website and I try and post things regularly ish on um, Facebook so and what's out. the website the website is uh, my three names all joined together, sarahlatipomanyika.com. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Until next time, Cheeky Natives.